Good afternoon. I would like to present myself and my group. I am uh, Stefano Slai Franceschini, director of the first uh, ENT unit uh, of University of Pisa, Italy. Uh, we'll see that patient with great disease, uh, uh, with, with great rompitopathy, uh, which need to be operated on, make up a very low percentage of patients with great disease. I have the opportunity of uh, operating on uh, 70 to 80 new patients a year because the endocrinologist group uh, at PISA is one of the most uh, important in Europe. And this is the group of Professor Pinkera. They see about uh, 350 new patients with great disease a year and they follow about uh, 1,300 patients with great disease a year. Craig's orbitopathy is uh, an autoimmune inflammatory disease with involvement of the extraocular muscles, intraconal fat, and eyelids. Most of the people with Craig disease are uh, women, but male uh, women have a high, uh, higher uh, probability of developing a GO. And uh, the um, the probability of developing GO uh, increases with age, and smoking uh, increases the risk of developing GO and decreases uh, the effectiveness of the high dose of glucocorticoid and uh, um, um, radiotherapy of the orbit. Craze uh, orbitopathy is present in 50% of patients with pain disease, but uh, uh, only two to five percent develops a severe uh, orbitopathy and uh, even less need surgery. Pathogenesis of GO is complex and completely understood. It is commonly believed that eye disease is triggered by an autoimmune reaction against antigens shared by the thyroid and the eye. When the eye disease has been triggered, proliferation of fibroblasts and adipocytes occurs and this causes uh, an increased secretion of uh, cytokines and glyco glycosaminoglycans. The latter hydrophilic in nature attract water with consequent uh, edema. <coughs> the proliferation of fibroblast causes uh, restrictive pharmacopoeia. So uh, fibrosis and uh, edema uh, causes dysfunction and proptosis. Patient may complain of spontaneous rotuburban pain, gaze, evoked pain, visual loss, diplopia, and GO uh, may, be, uh, may appear to be active or non-active features with more or less signs of acute inflammation. Uh, depending on the prevalence or, uh, of the restriction or edema, features of the disease may be very various. So uh, we have uh, eyelid erythema and edema, uh, sorry, eyelid retraction and leg lag uh, in down gates, conjunctival injection and chemosis, uh, proptosis. Proptosis is normally due to uh, the swelling of the soft tissue, uh, retrobulbar uh, soft tissue, when the orbital septum is lax. Um, slight motility impairment uh, with uh, diplopia in the extreme direction of gaze uh, or strabismus uh, and optic neuropathy. Optic neuropathy is due to uh, swelling of the soft tissue, intraorbital soft tissue, uh, more often mm, the, mm, the swelling of muscles when the orbital septum is tight. The, um, the, visual, uh, the impairment of visual field uh, or acuity or visual uh, color or the uh, increased uh, intraocular pressure is or are signs uh, of compression of the optic nerve at the, uh, the apex of the orbit. Uh, ocular motility impairment uh, is normally due to restriction of the extraocular muscle. Muscle which regardless uh, of their hypertrophy have lost elasticity. Esophthalmus is uh, normally due to a uh, swelling of the extraocular muscles because a pure fat swelling uh, is present in only 10% of patients. Measurement of esophthalmus may be manual or radiological, but these two uh, measures may be unequal in the same patient. And this is a concept to be kept in mind. 
a measurement may depend on who takes them. One millimeter of, of difference uh, means uh, an error uh, of one millimeter, and uh, one millimeter is uh, uh, an error ranging between 10 to 30 percent. So, uh, measurement is, uh, uh, we have to, to measure our, the proptosis of our patient, we have to report uh, our result and to, uh, to read the result of other authors, but uh, one millimeter means about nothing in a small uh, series uh, in particular. Another problem is uh, the normal value of proptosis. So because the normal isotermometric value is uh, uh, significantly depending on the, the race, the age, and the gender. Uh, all the authors agree on two facts. Men have a higher isotermometric value than uh, women, and black population has a higher isotermometric value than white population. For this two reasons, uh, it is very difficult to, uh, to state the, uh, the, the, the normal isotermometric, uh, is, uh, the, the, uh, to state if there is uh, an isotermos, and uh, when we have to deal with the patient, uh, we do, cannot know exactly how many millimeters of pathological proptosis there are. So this is another, uh, another uh, uh, for, for these two reasons, I mean, uh, we have to, to measure, to report our measurement, but uh, the, the goal of the surgery is to reduce proptosis, uh, but also to uh, look at the appearance of the patient and try to avoid post-operative dipropia or other complications. Uh, high dose uh, glucocorticoids remains the mainstay, the mainstay in medical treatment uh, of uh, GO, but medical treatment uh, is the job of the endocrinologist and it's up to the endocrinologist, uh, to the ophthalmologist and the patient to decide on surgery. The first step of surgery is orbital decompression and after the stabilization of the decompression of the reduction of proptosis, the uh, muscle surgery may be done if, if needed and the third step is eyelid surgery if needed or if it is demanded by the patient. Many techniques have been described uh, dealing with fat removal, bone wall decompression, or the combination of these uh, two techniques. But which are the pros and cons of these different techniques? First of all, detectomy, according to Olivari. There are discrepancies on the amount of uh, proptosis reduction and on the effects on eye movement in the report of different authors. The amount of fat in normals is about ACC and it can reach 10 cc in patients with GO, but only 10% of patients with GO has a pure fat swelling. So uh, the maximum amount of fat that uh, which can be removed is about 6 cc with this technique. The incision is uh, done about one centimeter above uh, the inferior margin of the superior eyelid and the strip of skin may be removed if needed. The uh, fat of the uh, superolateral compartment uh, removed is the fat of the eyelid. The fat of the medial, supramedial compartment is fat of the eyelid but also intraconal fat. Hemostasis is of primary importance because uh, in this technique uh, bone walls are not removed and bleeding may cause a serious visual impairment. The removal of the fat, the fat is, uh, is done in block, in block because it is easier. The eyelids are uh, pulled upwards uh, and tethered to make the uh, approach to the inferior eyelid easier. The, uh, op the orbital septum bulges uh, forwards uh, under the increased pressure and uh, it is opened. Fat uh, of the lateral, uh, infralateral compartment is uh, gently mobilized and removed and the mostasis is always very important. 
and at the end the fat of the inferomedial compartment is removed. <coughs> Fat of superior and inferolateral compartment can be removed in the orbital approach, in the bone orbital uh, decompression, we'll see uh, afterwards, when a trans uh, upper eyelid approach is performed. So, lipectomy is uh, a, a good procedure in patients with uh, um, um, the small uh, proptosis uh, when uh, fat involvement uh, is predominant but this happens of only in 10% of uh, patients because uh, in 90% of patients uh, swelling of the uh, extraocular muscle is predominant. Bone wall decompression uh, we can uh, remove or open all the orbital wall via different approaches. But strabismus still remains a significant complication of all orbital expansion technique. So it is uh, important to know why and how bone orbital expansion may cause lipopia. First, dysteroid orbitopathy uh, causes uh, an asymptomatic impairment uh, of the extraocular muscles. Second surgery, because the removal of the bone wall causes a centrifugal displacement of the rectus muscle close to the ostotomy. So the asymmetry of the pathology and the asymmetry of the orbital approach may contribute to a post-operative diplopia. And surgeon has to know a factor affecting surgical decision making. Most of the authors agree uh, on, on the fact that uh, two to four millimeters can be achieved per roll of decompression. And the degree of decompression is uh, uh, connected to the amount of bone removed and on the, the, to the volume of the structure around the orbit. The removal of the superior uh, wall provides uh, a small uh, space with the risk of the transmission of the pulsation or cerebral pulsation to the eyeball, but the removal of posterior tear third may be useful in cases of uh, compression of optic nerve. Total removal of the floor provides a good proptosis reduction with a high risk of post-operative uh, uh, infraorbital nerve expansion because of the pressure of the eyeball on the nerve and uh, the risk of a vertical diplopia due to the fact that the inferior rectus muscle is the most involved by the disease. The removal of the floor lateral to the infraorbital nerve provides a poor proptosis reduction with no risk of post-operative diplopia and uh, whereas the removal of the floor medial to the infraorbital nerve provides a good proptosis reduction but in my experience uh, a high risk of post-operative eye imbalance. The medial wall is removed according to many other techniques. Uh, but it is better to leave the anterior third in order to prevent the wide medial displacement of the eyeball and most of all to avoid closing the infundibulum. The removal of the greater sternal ring provides a good proptosis reduction with no risk of post-operative diplopia. And this is due to two facts. First, the lateral rectus muscle is the least involved by the disease and second, the, the, the volume we gain is almost posterior to the eyeball, so that the, the phenomenon of displacement of the, the muscle is minimized. Media wall decompression. Surgery begins with an ectomodectomy. The middle turbinate may be spared, but in the stoppy technique, it is usually removed to allow for a wider uh, surgical space. Ethmoidectomy goes on, uh, sorry, uh, go, goes on until the papyrasha is skeletonized. A wide opening of the stenoid and maxillary sinuses uh, allow us to, to perform a, a wide ectomidectomy and to skeletonize the medial and inferior orbital walls. 
the posterior third or two thirds of the papyracia are removed according to the, um, to the patient need. And uh, the posterior third of the floor, medial to the infraorbital nerve, may be removed, may be removed with uh, a diamond bar without additional risk of postoperative diplopia. The total removal of the floor medial to infraorbital nerve is performed only in selected cases because of the high risk of postoperative eye imbalance. Uh, uh, the middle turbinate is spared because its removal may slightly increase the risk of postoperative diplopia. The paparaccia is removed, denounced according to the case, but always sparing the anterior third. An elevator is carefully utilized in order to prevent the opening of the periorbiter in this phase. Otherwise, the contents of the orbit enter the operative field and hinder the procedure. The posterior part of the floor is also removed, according to the seriousness of the case, with a drill or a scalpel. The angle between the maxillary antrum and the medial orbital wall has been removed posteriorly. The surgeon checks if the amount of paparaccia removed is enough according to the preoperative plan. The incision of the periorbiter of the medial wall is performed with a sickle knife. The incisions are carried from posterior to anterior, being careful not to damage the medial rectus muscle. The fat must, under no circumstances, be pulled. And on to the right side. The incision of the periorbiter is performed in the same manner. It may occur that, in cases in which the paparaccia is very thin, small fragments of bone may remain and can be removed at this time. The remaining fragments of the paparaccia have to be removed, all the time paying particular attention in order to avoid encroaching on its anterior third. The incision of the periorbiter continues as long as is necessary, based on the specific context of the patient concerned. I'm sorry, but well, you have the, the tape in your uh, CD and uh, you, I have others here. That I want <coughs> decompression. I <coughs> normally use uh, an upper eyelid approach and the incision is done above about one centimeter above the uh, inferior margin of the superior eyelid and it, it is extended laterally uh, six millimeters uh, above the lateral canthus. Ideal, ideally, the incision includes the skin and the orbicularis oculi muscle, which are tightly connected. Thus, uh, it is important not to cut too deeply because there is the risk of damaging the elevator palpebral muscle. For this reason, it's better to incise only the skin and afterwards lifting the skin to cut through the muscle. If a blue tissue appears, it means that we have cut the elevator and uh, we have reached the conjunctiva. The uh, immediate application of the two, three, uh, five over resolvable stitches will solve the problem. Uh, afterwards, uh, uh, lifting uh, the skin muscle flap, uh, the section proceeds laterally until the um, front of zygomatic arc and the periosteum is incised. Pulling the eyeball inferiorly, uh, the elevation continues uh, superiorly because uh, it is easier due to the smooth surface of the bone. Afterwards, elevation continues uh, laterally to the, uh, to the floor and uh, it is important to, to burn the small vessel uh, coming from the bone to the eyeball. During elevation, the periorbital may be broken. 
and this makes the operation more difficult because uh, the, the fat uh, penetrates in the operative field. So inserting a elastic sheet uh, prevent <coughs> penetration of the fat, makes operation easier and uh, Allows, uh, allows us to use a smaller uh, malleable retractor, increasing the size of the subject of field. Retracting the skin with a suture permits the second surgeon to have a, a hand free, and the use of silicone tube prevents damage to of the skin. Drilling starts from the superior lateral part of the orbit, thinning the bone until the manning is visible. Afterwards, uh, on the lateral wall, partially uncovering the temporalis muscle, and then deeply uh, uncovering, uh, uh, thinning the bone until the manix is visible, is better not to uncover the manix, but nothing happened. At that point, surgeon has to change position in order to drill the inferior part of the orbit. The maxillary sinus can be opened laterally to the infraorbital canal. The, uh, the amount of space gained depends on the amount of bone removed. With this approach, it's possible to remove the lateral part of the roof, all the greater spinal ring, part of the zygomatic bone, and the floor lateral to the infraorbital nerve. Starting superiorly and laterally, the eye is elevated carefully in order not to break the periorbiter. In the area of the frontozygomatic junction, the periosteum is deeply attached to the bone. Small vessels from the bone to the eye are cauterized. In the emperolateral tract, a small trigeminal branch to the lacrimal gland is cut together with a vessel. the elevation of the eye and they proceed. Having accomplished the periorbital elevation down to the inferior orbital fissure, the drilling of the bone may start. The eye is retracted and the drilling begins in the supralateral area. Starting from the orbital rim, drilling proceeds along the lateral aspect of the orbital root. Starting with a cutting burr, bone is removed. Drilling must be careful because the bone is normally thin in this area. As the meninx appears, the use of a diamond burr is safer. A diamond burr is also useful to stop the bleeding from the bone. Following the meninx of the anterior cranial fossa, the apex of the orbit is reached. The dura mater of the middle cranial fossa is visualized. A bar of bone, crossed by small vessels, is left between the anterior and the middle cranial fossa. Its removal would serve no purpose. After visualizing the anterior and the middle cranial fossa, the dissection goes on inferiorly. The eye is elevated further until the lateral part of the orbital floor is visualized. The surgeon must change position to have a correct view of this area. Elevation of the eye finishes when the inferior orbital fissure is reached. The infralateral area of the orbit is now approached. Sometimes it may be necessary to move the position of the head of the patient to obtain a correct view. First, a cutting burr is utilized to thin the orbit rim. By drilling the zygomatic bone, the inferior part of the temporalis muscle and the fat of the infratemporal fossa are visualized. At this point, the use of a diamond burr is safer. Afterward, the lateral part of the orbital floor is drilled out, lateral to the infraorbital nerve. The maxillary antrum is entered. The infraorbital nerve, if visualized, is saved carefully. 
is in any case of paramount importance that the surgeon drills with great care in this area. Having changed position again, the surgeon's next step is the removal of the bone medial to the temporalis muscle. Drilling begins with a cutting burr, but after a short while, a diamond burr <coughs> seems safer. This step could be performed first in surgery, but the uncovered muscle may bleed if struck, and the bleeding slows the operation. The remaining bone of the great sphenoidal wing is removed with a diamond burr. Now, it is possible to check the wide space obtained after uncovering the dura mater of the anterior and middle cranial fossae. Little bone remains in the area of the apex of the orbit. The new wide orbital cavity is checked to be sure that there is no bleeding and to verify that the bone has been wholly removed. The fat of the infratemporal fossa and the temporalis muscle are visualized inferiorly. The periorbiter is now incised, starting from the posterior part. The incision goes on from posterior to anterior, being careful to avoid damage to the lateral rectus muscle and, at this point, to the intercanal fat. One centimetre of periorbiter is left untouched anteriorly. The periorbiter is opened in the medial and inferior part of the orbits first. The dissection of the periorbiter proceeds superiorly, slowly and carefully. The lacrimal gland is freed and any connection to the sheath is cut. The superficial septa of the fat are broken. Opening the periorbiter superiorly, attention must be paid not to damage the first branch of the trigeminal nerve. After visualizing the nerve, the periorbiter medial to the nerve may be opened too. The lateral rectus muscle must be visualized completely, leaving the more anterior part of the periorbiter unbroken. The fat of the area inferior to the lateral rectus muscle is visualized easily. The fat of the lower lateral quadrant may be removed up to an amount of 2 cc if needed. A bipolar cauterization is necessary to prevent bleeding. The fibrous septa of the fat are now cut, trying to promote the herniation of the fat. These maneuvers are performed in both eyes, laterally and medially, alternately. The patient with monolateral proptosis, preoperatively. <coughs> the same patient at the end of the operation. <coughs> A bilateral orbital decompression. At the end of the operation, the degree of decompression and the eye balance are checked. A comparison of the relative stiffness of the eyes is also useful. Another patient. Proptosis and eye balance are checked preoperatively. <coughs> the right eye has been partially decompressed. Comparisons of the degree of decompression and checks as to the eye balance are frequently performed at several stages during surgery. At the end of the operation, the degree of decompression is satisfactory, the eyes are balanced, and exhibit the same reduction of proptosis. At the end of the procedure, the lids are sewn with a 4-0 nylon stitch. Drainage is set in the lateral part of the orbits. Steri strips are utilized to cover the stitching and to close the eyes. The eyes are bandaged under low pressure. The inferior approach. Uh, maybe uh, we can use a transcutaneous uh, approach, uh, subciliary osmotarsal or a swinging eyelid approach. 
The subsidiary incision can be extended laterally along uh, the skin tension lines, whereas the subtarsal incision cannot, but both of them are enough to approach the inferior wall. In the subsidiary approach, the skin, uh, uh, the subcutaneous elevation of the skin is continued uh, inferiorly a few millimeters uh, above the inferior margin of the tarsal plate, and afterwards uh, the orbicularis uh, is uh, uh, dissected. In the sub uh, tarsal approach, skin and muscle are dissected together, and the approach to the orbital septum is uh, more direct. The skin is uh, uh, ink and uh, in, uh, injected with the vasoconstrictor and uh, elevation of the mm, skin muscle flap from the orbicularis uh, from the orbital septum is uh, extended inferiorly below the level of the floor of the orbit. The periosteum uh, is incised and the elevation uh, begin in uh, on the floor. The insertion of the inferior oblique muscle is the medial limit uh, of this approach. The swinging eyelid approach uh, allows us to approach also the lateral wall. The incision includes the skin, the orbicularis oculi muscle, the septum, the lateral cantal tendon and conjunctiva, and it is extended laterally about one centimeter from the lateral cantus. There is no risk of damage uh, fibers of the facial nerve because they are not fib fibers of the facial nerve in the two centimeters area at that level. The inferior eyelid uh, is averted <coughs> in order to visualize the inferior margin of the tarsal plate and starting laterally the conjunctiva is incited along the inferior margin of the tarsal plate. The inferior conjunctiva is dissected free and suturized to the, to the superior eyelid with uh, four, five, five or uh, stitches in order to prevent uh, corneal damage. Afterwards, uh, this, uh, during the, the subperiosteal uh, dissection, uh, also uh, on the floor we can encounter vessel uh, which uh, uh, must be uh, cauterized to prevent uh, annoying bleeding. Uh, also on the floor, uh, I use uh, a, a, a silastic sheet to avoid the penetration of the fat in the operative field. After the bone approach, we have to perform the incision of the preorbita. And this is a very important step in surgery because the uh, post-operative dipropia <coughs> is most uh, dependent on the incision of the preorbita. And preorbita uh, needs to be incised in order to allow for the orbital fat and muscle to prolapse uh, into the adjacent spaces. Uh, I do an anteroposterior incision of the preorbita followed by vertical joining of the anteroposterior incision. In the medial preorbita, only the fat superior to the medial rectus muscle is worked in in order to augment the compression. I avoid uh, working in uh, the fat inferior to the medial rectus muscle because in my experience uh, is very uh, dangerous as far as post-operative diplopia is concerned. The lateral periorbita I avoid incision in the anterior uh, uh, 1, uh, 5 to 10 millimeters in order not to displace the rectus muscle pulley. And in my experience uh, and uh, in experience of other authors, uh, the fact of the inferolateral orbit can be removed safely. If we do the approach to the floor, we may remove the fat as in the Olivari technique. So the uh, decision making uh, in approach the patient with graze orbitopathy. Uh, patient with optic neuropathy uh, must be operated on as soon as possible without interest in post-operative diplopia. In patient without optic neuropathy, the goals of the uh, surgery is uh, uh, the maximum posterior displacement uh, of the eyeball, trying to minimize the risk of the post-operative diplopia. 
And uh, the last uh, uh, is the prob problem of the retraction of the popular refraction. If there is a, a very serious retraction, it is better not to use a translate approach. In patients with optic neuropathy, if proptosis is less than 22, about 22 millimeters, a medial approach may be enough. But uh, if proptosis is more than 22 millimeters, I normally perform also a lateral approach with lipectomy. Uh, this patient uh, had the previous operation for uh, an, an optic neuropathy, but uh, the surgeon did not tailor the operation to the patient need. He performed a lipectomy together with uh, as a partial opening of the medial and lateral wall. And it is possible to see the compression of the optic nerve at the apex because he didn't open the apex, and the lateral rectus muscle bent on the remnant stenoidal wing and the clouded orbit. I uh, operated on uh, this patient again and I widened the apex and moving all the bone and it is possible to see the, the optic nerve free and this was the uh, satisfactory result. As far as proptosis is uh, uh, concerned, when it is less than 22 millimeters, uh, we may use uh, an olivari technique or a media wall approach. When proptosis is between 22 to 26, uh, I begins with a lateral approach, and if it is not enough, uh, I do also a medial approach, uh, a balance of the compression. When proptosis is uh, more serious, uh, it is, uh, I normally begin with a balance uh, medial and lateral wall approach, and I use an inferior approach uh, uh, too uh, if the, the compression is not satisfactory. When proptosis is very serious, uh, three wall uh, decompression may be not enough, and sometimes it's necessary to do a lateralization of the orbital rim. This patient had a light proptosis and an endoscopic approach turned out to be enough. In this patient, the difference between the two eyes was higher and I did a lateral approach. This is the example of a balance decompression by removal wider the lateral wall and the medial wall. And in this patient, I performed the three wall uh, approach, but uh, it was not enough, so that I performed in a second operation the lateralization of the rim. As far as uh, preoperative diplopia is concerned, uh, it does not influence the choice of surgical approach in patients with optic neuropathy. But in patients uh, with, uh, without optic neuropathy, I try uh, to avoid removing the bone close to a restricted muscle. And this is an example. Uh, if the medial rectus muscle is restricted and the, uh, it is a very frequent situation, the, the wide removal of the medial wall <coughs> make the muscle uh, uh, pull the eyeball toward itself. <coughs> this is a, a very uncommon and difficult case. Uncommon because the eyeball was deviated laterally inferiorly because of the uh, inferior oblique muscle restriction. And uh, uh, difficult because monolateral. We have to deal uh, with the normal eye, I mean, to balance the compression. And uh, I uh, widely opened uh, the, the orbit superiorly and medially. The orbital decompression could be superior by removing all the media and the lateral wall, but so doing uh, the uh, deviation of the eyeball did not uh, worsen. And this is another difficult case because monolateral, because of the serious uh, eyeball deviation, I plan to perform only a lateral approach, but at the end uh, the decompression was not enough. So I was compelled to open also the medial wall, but I did it only partially in the posterior part, and uh, the deviation of the eyeball improved. This is a patient in which it's better not to perform a superior trans eyelid approach. These are complications reported in literature. In my experience, uh, complications 
has been an after effect of transnasal approach. I had six rhinal liquorea closely inoperatively, but in two patients the fistula, the closure of the fistula uh, was not well done, and I had one meningitis and one pneumocephalus. I had two monolateral partial visual loss, one due to a fragment of bone of the optic canal rotated against the nerve, another one without detectable cause. The break of the Mannix, removing the sphenoidal wing laterally, is not a major complication because the fat, intraconal fat, closed the break at the end of operation. This is the patient with the fragment of bone which I removed a few days after in second operation. Both of them improved but not completely in six months. In conclusion, uh, the technique has been tailored to the patient need rather than fit the patient into a singular approach and a good result does not consist solely in a significant reduction of proptosis and uh, in patient with optic neuropathy we have to, to decompress the apex regardless of the post-operative diplopia. In patients without optic neuropathy, we try to reduce the risk of post-operative diplopia. Uh, sorry, patients with optic neuropathy, without optic neuropathy. And uh, I normally spare the bone close to a restricted muscle, and uh, I avoid the standing osteotomy to the orbital rim and to incise the anterior periorbita in order not to displace the rectus muscle pulleys. And uh, the, the, the fat uh, or the inferolateral compartment is removed safely, but medially I manage only the fat superior to the medial rectus muscle. I always try to balance the compression because uh, at the end of operation uh, it's better that the patient uh, has the eyeball at the same level. So uh, any maneuver of the compression has to be done in the worst eye first, if any, because the worst eye is the most difficult to decompress. And uh, sometimes stopping the compression in the better eye to leave the eyes at the same level. And this is my experience uh, at the end of 2010, uh, the experience over 18 years. I performed a lot of balance decompression, but now the trend is to start with the lateral approach because the, the risk of the post-operative diplopia is, uh, is uh, less. And uh, uh, sometimes I perform uh, in, in the second stage uh, the endoscopic approach uh, if it is uh, demanded by the patient or if it needed. Thank you. If you have a question. Thank you.